Islamic Studies Monitor. Um, today we will have the chance to talk about Konrad Herschler's book, A, a Monument to the Syrian Book Culture, the Library of, library of Ibn Abdel Hadi. Um, I will have a brief introduction of the guests and the lecturers, and then uh, we will have them to talk about the book and the Fahrest, uh, respectively. Uh, well, uh, Konrad, after being at Soaz University of London for almost nine years, is now professor and director of the Institute of Islamic Studies at Freie Universität Berlin. Uh, his work focuses mainly on medieval Middle Eastern history with particular reference to uh, Egypt and Syria, history of archive, manuscript studies, history of the Middle East and the period of cruise in the period of crusades, history of reading and history of the book. He is the author of Medieval Arabic Historiography in 2006, which is translated into Persian uh, and is published in 2016. He is also the author of The Written Word in the Medieval Arabic Lands uh, medi and Medieval Damascus, Plurality and Diversity in an Arab Arabic Library, uh, both of which I think are award winnings. Uh, and uh, the current work, which is a monument to medieval Syrian book culture, the library of Ibn Abdel Hadi, um, which is published by Edinburgh University Press last year. I think we now have uh, said Ali, Tabo Tabo E, let me disable my video so that he, she, he can join. Hello, Salam sir. Alaikum. Salam alaikum. Welcome, and very nice to see you. Thank you, me too. Um, I, I'm now introducing the uh, guest, and then we will uh, continue the talk by, by Konrad first. Um, and Sarah is professor at the Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations at the Aga Khan University. Uh, she is a cultural historian specializing in the uh, Middle East and Iran between 600 and 1100. She received her PhD from Harvard University in 2006. And prior to joining uh, Aga Khan University in 2007, she was a Sultan postdoctoral fellow at the University of California, Berkeley. She is the author of The New Muslims of Post-Conquest Iran, Tradition, Memory, and Con Conversion mm -hmm. by Cambridge University Press in 2013. Her other publications include The Excellence of the Arabs, a translation of Ibn Qutaybaz, Fazl al-Arab wa Tanbih ala ulumeh, uh, with Peter Webb, which was published by New York University Press in 2016, as well as articles and edited volumes dealing with ethnic identity, cultural memory, genealogy, and history writing. Her current book project focuses on the history of books in the Middle East, uh, and uh, with a team, she is developing dig digital methods to study the origins and development of the Arabic and Persian textual traditions. She is also the principal investigator for the Arabic Digital uh, Humanities Project, uh, which is named Knowledge, Information, Technology, and the Arabic Book, uh, abbreviated as Kitab. And Said Ali Tabo Taboi SD is the Dean of Muhaqqaq Tabo Taboi Foundation and also the Dean of Sayyid Seminary in Najaf, which is one of the most influential houses in Iraq. Uh, his area of specialty is manuscript studies and history of the book. And he has published the critical edition of Ibn Shah Rashub's Alam al Tara'iq al-Hudud al-Haqa'iq in 2014. Uh, he has also indexed Islamic, Islamic manuscripts of the Library of UCLA, which is, albeit still unpublished. We hope it will be published soon. Um, and thank you, Konrad, thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Sayed, uh, for joining us. Uh, I think we can, we, we can begin by uh, Konrad speaking uh, a little bit about the book uh, and then continue with, uh, with Said Ali and Sarah respectively to uh, make their points and reflections about the book and the Fahrest uh, itself. So Konrad, uh, we are at your service and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much Mohsen um, for the introduction and um, thank you also very much for the the University of Tehran um, Faculty of Theology and Islamic Studies for hosting this fabulous event, um, which um, I think is wonderful and to bring together scholars from different traditions. And thank you, Sarah, and all the acquaintance of mine for taking her time to be here today. 
and to say Ali Tabataba Yazdi, whom I've never met before, and I'm very glad to meet today, and for also taking this time uh, so that we can um, discuss the book. So, um, Moxon, we agreed on something like 10 minutes uh, for the introduction, not to make it too long um, um, for a starter. And I thought the best thing is probably to explain it a little bit um, against the background of my personal trajectory, how I have come to this book and, and what has led me to this book. Um, and for that, I would like to share my screen. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is basically um, what I did during my PhD. That was uh, work on historical writing, historical thinking in the 13th century Miladi, 7th century Hitchery and an attempt to understand why people were writing history and how they wrote history in Bilat Sham, roughly. And while I spe was spending my years on the authors and the texts, I increasingly wondered who was actually reading these texts, um, as much as I was wondering how who would ever read my book. But also, I mean, I've spent so much time with these medieval texts, but who read them and how did they read them and how did they engage with these texts? So after finishing um, that book, um, my next project was to get my head around reading and um, how we could con conceptualize reading. And the outcome was this book, The Written Word in the Medieval Arabic Lands, which is really an attempt to try out different source corpora in order to understand reading. Um, and obviously reading is so difficult to understand because it leaves so few traces, except for the exceptional scholars, for the large scholars. We can trace it in their works when they have citations, when they have references, when they have quotes, etc. But for the more average um, people, there's very little chance to see anything, um, or it's very hard to, to, to see reading. So that's what I did in that book. and. Um, there were four main ways which I proposed to think about reading, um, of which there were two which really fascinated me. Two others were fine. I wrote the chapter, but that was about it. I didn't think there's much more um, in these um, attempts. And one of them is um, the um, manuscript notes, the Sama and the Ijaza, um, of which we find ten of thousands. Um, probably over 100,000 um, for Bilat Sham in the 6th, 7th, 8th century um, Hitchri, um, 12th, 13th, 14th century Miladi. Um, here's one example of a random manuscript in um, Berlin, um, which always start with Sameh Ajamir had the Majlis, Min left the Sheikh al-Imam al-Alim, and afterwards we have the name of those who participated. So these always give an insight into reading practices and most particularly into larger audiences of reading practices. So this is one of the uh, source genres which really fascinated me and which have fascinated me over the last 10 years. I continue to work on them, but I've not really succeeded yet to bring them to a level of a real project um, because there are so many, they are so difficult to work with, so they always linger of kind of in the background of what I'm doing. The other source genre, which I tried out in that book, um, apart from the Sama Ijaza, was library catalogs. Um, and that definitely got me going, um, as you can see from my subsequent work. And that's um, the catalog of the Ashrafia Mausoleo, Turbat al Ashrafia, Fidimashk, um, which was founded in the seventh century Hijri. Um, which is a very marginal turba. It's not important at all. Um, it was a very marginal scholarly um, institution, but by chance, or well, not by chance, we, um, we have around 2,000 books registered in this catalog. And it's amazing that we have such a marginal scholarly institution which has this enormous quantity of books if we compare to other world regions. Um, and secondly, what was really fascinating in this catalog was 
um, the plurality and diversity of the subjects which we find in a scholarly library, i.e. well beyond Quran, Hadith, Fiqh, we also find mathematics, we find medicine, we find a lot of other, we find a lot of poetry. And so that was more or less the first attempt for the Arabic lands to come up with a library catalog and to do a study on reading practices on the basis of what was actually in the library, um, not on reports about libraries, but on actual documentary evidence. While I was working on that catalog, um, I came across um, the Fikhris of Ibn Abdul Hadi, and that's the topic um, of today's session, um, which is very different from the preceding one from the Ashrafia catalog. Here we have a private library of a scholar, um, of a scholar who was in the process of endowing his books. This is not really a legal document. Um, this is not the Wakfia itself, but it's clearly related to the Wakfia in a way which we don't really understand because the Wakfia has not survived, nor has any other document survived from this, um, from this um, process of endowing books. We only have this figures. Um, and this is the monument to medieval Syrian book culture. And what I tried to book, apart from editing yet again another library catalog, basically piling another one on top of the first one, um, were two things um, which I found particularly fascinating. The first one was the monument bit, i.e., to what extent. This collection in the late 9th century history was a very conscious project of a scholar to frame a, an, an idea about a book culture. Now, that might not seem very surprising. We do the same today. Our private libraries are expression of such attempts. Institutional libraries are an um, expression of such attempts. But what is noteworthy is that the vast majority of pre-Ottoman manuscripts which survive today in Damascus. If you go to the Maktab al-Wataniyat in Damascus, the vast majority of manuscripts come from Ibn Abdul Hadi, from his personal library. So this man in the ninth century history was very successful in preserving specific bits of Damascene book culture and preserving them for the next century until today. So if we enter today the, the Maktab al-Wataniyat, Fidimash, um, and look at the pre-Ottoman manuscript collection, what we see is not Damascene book culture, but it's Damascene book culture according to Ibn Abdul Hadi and his ideas about what matters and what does not matter. So that was the one point I wanted to drive home, to what extent such a project has an impact on how we see the past. And the second point, um, is nicely um, summarized by this picture. That's one of the manuscripts of Ibn Abdul Hadi. Um, this is one which left Damascus. This is today in Paris, in the Bibliothèque, in the National Library of um, Paris, um, wrongly classified as a Turkic manuscript, scandalously so. I have no idea whoever thought that this, <laughs> there might be any link to Turkish in this manuscript. And what you see here is Ibn Abdul Hadi, who himself bound this. Majmua. It's he himself did this work. And you see the various small booklets which he put together in this Majmua. And so the second point which mattered to me in this book was really material culture. I, to what extent it's important to work with the books as objects in order to understand what these books were meant to do. And I must admit that I worked on the Fikhrist for two years without seeing a manuscript of Ibn Abdul Hadi. Only I saw only the digitized versions. And it's only when I sat in Paris and for the first time had this manuscript in my hand and looked from it from all sides and really understood what they looked like that I started to understand what the project of Ibn Abdul Hadi was. Um, so this materiality um, angle, um, to integrate that into um, my work, at least, was for me quite exciting. And just to finish off, um, I don't, this is the last slide. Um, what I'm doing now um, is basically a book project on the um, sale booklet of a certain Burhanuddin 
Anasiri, um, a scholar in Jerusalem. Right. And that's one of the few estate documents which we have, which was written after his death and which records his private library and the prices of the books, which these books fetched in the auction after his death. So that's another attempt to basically get my head around book culture in Bilatisham in the pre-Ottoman period, but that's something for later on. Okay, so much from my side. Well, thank you very much. I think uh, we lost said Ali. I wanted him to speak next about the Fehrest, but he has lost his connection. Let me. Um, maybe maybe we should we should go on with Sarah and then turn to Ali. Thank you. Okay. Good. Um, Conrad, it's, it's a delight to hear you speak. And um, because I've, I, I'm sitting here um, in my little tiny office with all of your books um, and was just having a chance to reflect on your work over a long time because you, you read things as they come out and then sometimes the whole picture, you know, doesn't coalesce into a vision. So you've already answered the question that I was going to end with. If you could put it together for everyone. Um, and I think that's really helpful. The, um, if I could just, maybe make a few comments that say why I think this book is so exciting and why I've learned so much from reading it. And I do that, I think, in light of your total work. So I'm really happy you've presented it in that way. Um, it's really rare to have a picture of a human being from this time period that's as vivid as I think we now have of Ibn Abd al-Hadi himself. And the way you brought him to life, I thought was phenomenal. Um, so the description um, of him as an individual, his family, the Maqtisi, the Ibn Qudama line, the economic position, his location in the Salahiyah quarter, um, where he acquired his materials. I mean, I, I'm not a specialist in this time period or in this um, particular locale, but you, know, the, you gave me such a good sense of him, where he is, his family. I felt so. There's a for those who haven't yet read the book. Um, he he narrates the story of Conrad does um, of his family. I mean, so we learn quite a lot about um, you know his wife, his concubines, his children, and amongst them, for example, we learn his disappointment with his eldest son Abdul Hadi, who apparently um, you know did not attend the reading sessions and was a bit unreliable, and then his you know, the endowment, um, you know, the, his works pass into an endowment and then are sold, you know, afterwards. So, um, you know, I think on a human level, um, having such a connection and understanding of uh, Ibn Abdul Hadi, I think is quite remarkable. And that then allows us to understand, I think, what he's up to in a way that would be, I think, really difficult, actually, if we didn't have a visual and human connection to the person at the center of this story. And, um, Sort of the three, I think the three things I take in general from this book, I would I would put them in this kind of categories. Um, first, um, with regards to the picture of post canonical hadith, um, the ephemeral nature of the book. <laughs> you know, we we think of books often as beautiful objects. Um, we think, especially, I think book history, you know, as a field, has really fixated on the beautiful object. And as you rightly point out, Conrad, the catalogs often serve this purpose in the way in which they're organized. Um, illustrations you know, um, are rightly studied from an art histo historical point of view. But sort of the reality of the way in which people like perhaps Ibn Abd al-Hadi and his contemporaries and others interacted with the written word was much more um, probably uh, you know, commonplace. It was practical. It, it didn't necessarily have um, the permanence that we might associate with some of the beautiful Shahnameh manuscripts, for example. Instead, we're dealing with a body of material that um, really was useful, you know, in, in its own ways, in its own times. Um, you know, for thinking about what we have today, then, in terms of this issue you raise about, um, you don't use this term, but I think I take this to be what you're speaking about. Um, we have a, a pronounced survival bias when we go as historians to the body of material to try to study it. And what we have 
is what's been printed. We often have, you know, what's been printed in particular times, what manuscripts have been well known and circulated. But in the total context of what was read, discussed, um, circulated in, in historic times, it's really quite, you, you get the sense from reading your book how inadequate our knowledge is, you know, in general. I mean, you've only looked at one place. You know, we have the rest of, of the Middle East, I think, to reckon with. Um, secondly, I take from your book, you know, I, I really enjoyed what you termed um, an analysis of the life cycle of manuscripts. And this term reuse, I think, is quite a powerful one. It animates our work on the Kitab project, certainly. And, you know, the, the sort of micro history of the way in which you have narrated um, the creation, usage, ownership, and endowment of books, I think tells us quite a lot um, about sort of the way in which books exist within society and the way in which there's a sort of ecology um, that operates both with the book and with the text, which I, you meaningfully distinguish as two things. The book is an object, the text is what's written into it. And both of these, I think, are quite interesting. And um, your raising of the object to our focus, I think, can also help us understand the text as well. Um, so I think that's a subject for a separate discussion, but it really intrigues me. Um, and then finally, I, I think I admire the way in which you've brought out this project of Ibn Abdul Hadi. So if, if first, you know, we're thinking about post-canonical hadith as a field and book, you know, is, a, is the object of this period. Second, we're talking about circulation. Um, what's he up to? And I think oftentimes um, being able to see the forest for the trees can be quite hard when one looks at these materials. I remember you presenting on these some years ago and I sort of felt like, wow, that's, <laughs> That's a very, very deep and wide river of much. I mean, it was just, they're, they're quite tricky and they're very difficult to read. And as you, as you quite correctly point out, he was, um, you know, he was a notary, right? I mean, so he's, his, his day job or his other economic means of surviving, you know, was not about producing beautiful books. It was about quite practical uses of writing. And you, you mentioned his mise en page as being rather, um, maybe not attractive, um, quite um, difficult. But he's still he's still engaged in this massive kind of project, um, and there's elements of it that you raise out. This monumentalization, this is a I think a, a good concept is a field that we can work with. So the notion um, of the ritualistic and devotional practices that are linked, you know, with with books, um, I think are quite important. Um, the manuscript you just showed, Ibn Abdul Hadi was binding things himself, um, and I think in the study of the um, composite manuscripts, um, I, I don't think we often imagine that. Um, I think we imagine this as, as a project of, you know, the Ottomans in much later periods, but to be actually to go back and be able to see that, I think is really important. Um, the, your discussion of the Buldaniyat, um, you know, are these collections of, of works that are located specifically in locations that, you know, he's excited obviously about um, both collecting and creating works that um, locate, um, you know, the, the books within specific locations or hadith in that case. So um, these are some points I just took, you know, from reading this book. Um, I think on the field, you know, is a, in a long kind of looking at the long durée, I would advise students to read your introduction and to read your first chapter to understand the way in which um, the field is evolving when in terms of book history, because it's really rather up to date, um, you know, in terms of the historiography of Middle Eastern book history. And I think there's quite a lot that we can all learn and contemplate, you know, your discussion of the material philology, you know, as a turn, the move towards documentary work. Um, we've become much more technical, I think, as a field, you know, in Middle Eastern history since I first began, certainly in the 90s. Um, and I, I wonder, so my, my question to you, and I realize um, I'm not thought to speak, but if, you know, can you describe, you know, for students perhaps, um, how you concretely worked and what they need to learn <laughs> to, to work with books in a similar way? I, I'm, I'm very struck by how technical the work you did is, um, by how much um, knowledge of scripts, um, of patience you had to execute, you know, in, in getting through this material. And I wonder, you know, what, what do students need to do 
in order to be able to undertake similar projects? And then also, what kinds of projects can you see beyond your own? I'm curious to hear, because obviously you've worked very deeply and closely with Bilad Hashem. I wonder, um, my own you know, slight experience with Iranian context would say that there's much work to be done in Iran, for example, in cities like Shiraz, you know, on manuscript history. And you can tell there's stories to be told there too. So I'm just wondering if you could share some guidance, you know, perhaps for students. So that's, that's the end of my comments. Thank you very much. Uh, th thank you, Sarah. It was very insightful. Even for students here uh, to pick a project uh, and maybe Konrad's uh, reply will make some projects uh, again. Um, and now, uh, let me uh, said Ali, sorry for uh, for uh, postpone your uh, lecture after Sarah because uh, you lost the connection. Uh, yeah, I do apologize because of uh, my slow connection. Yes. Now uh, we we are at the service. Uh, Ali will talk about the Fehrest itself uh, with uh, in 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 his own perspective, and we will uh, listen to another aspect of. Of the Fahrist and Abdul Hadi, and then we will uh, go on to discuss it. Thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thonsi Kenansu Lanan al-Hasla. And nice to meet you, Miss Sarah Savant. Uh, as mentioned, the book focuses and focuses on a book list that belongs to Ibn Abdul Hadi, the famous uh, Hanbali scholar. Uh, this catalog is a combination of uh, a lot of book titles, authors and uh, scribers' names, and rarely some information about the manuscripts, including his own written books. He wrote mainly in jurisprudence and hadith. Uh, but we also find him a writer in literature, uh, biographies, history, uh, uh, theology, and even in medicine. Uh, this catalog, as mentioned, is an endowment uh, dedicated to his descendants and uh, some others. Uh, uh, mentioning uh, the necessity of the readers to be humblies. Uh, this text already was published uh, before uh, by Dar al as uh, the, by the title Fahris al Kutub al Mawqufa. And in addition, we uh, see a lot of citations to the manuscript of this catalog in the National Library of Damascus in uh, the other book of the compiler, Mahd al Sawab, uh, by its editor. By its editor, uh, that's published uh, by the Islamic University of Medina in Saudi Arabia. Uh, but Herschler here made a masterpiece in his work on this important medieval document. Its importance is uh, because it includes um, a lot of title books don't, that don't exist nowadays. Although we, say, we see uh, a lot of famous titles in it, such as Al-Ahqam al-Sultaniya or Dala'al uh, al-Nubuwa al-Bayhaqi, uh, we find also uh, very important and great information in it, uh, like what the compiler tells us about uh, his own books and uh, information uh, about uh, his teachers by mentioning uh, authors and uh, uh, inscribers by Shaykhuna. We can also understand uh, some traditions via this text. It's very important. For example, uh, some titles of books, uh, such as 
مسند عم عبد بن حميد أو الأم بالمعروف للحافظ عبد الغني and some other books are repeated in this catalog as there were two copies of them in this library. And it shows us that uh, it shows us the their notice to the narration tradition and uh, uh, the various versions of the text. Uh, it was very easy for the catalogs audiences in that time to understand what the compiler is saying uh, because they lived in the humble world of Damascus in that specific time and that given tradition. But after centuries, uh, uh, excuse me, do you have uh, my voice? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, but af but uh, after centuries, we lost uh, the conventions, the conventions, the, the evidences, uh, the semantic of phrases and sometimes the symbols. A researcher nowadays should discover the conventions and the, the principles of the method, uh, the methods in that specific school of narration and the rules of scribers in, in that given a tradition. So I highly recommend uh, to notice to such a research, I mean Herschler's research on this text, uh, to learn how, how Herschler uh, processed the text step by step, uh, regardless of uh, the Hanbali tradition. And uh, set it down in your similar works, of course, with uh, differences in uh, details. The compiler follows uh, the system uh, of most authors of book lists in the medieval uh, centuries uh, that present, and, and the presented information are highly condensed. We see uh, uh, we see the, the, the this system in the list in the lists of the scholars in our tradition uh, in that uh, uh, times uh, such as Al uh, Fahris Ibn Al Nadim or Al Fahris Al Tusi or uh, its supplementation Ma'alim of Ibn Shah Rashub and uh, uh, that uh, which are uh, so uh, uh, so convinced uh, and so uh, convinced and uh, the presented information uh, um, mostly are uh, just in two or three keywords. Ibn Abdul Hadi follows uh, exactly this system of telling us uh, the uh, books in his library. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the condensed information only contains some keywords. What uh, Herschler mentioned that I'm wrong. And this catalog. Is, um, uh, um, and this catalog includes about 3,000 titles in such a system. Uh, the uh, single text, uh, the composites, and the incom incomplete manuscripts uh, are inter uh, intermingled. Ibn Abdul Hadi, like other authors of book lists in the medieval uh, centuries, um, tends to cite only one or two keywords from the title. A complete title is um, is the exception. When identifying titles and understanding which book is exactly uh, cited, you 
confront a huge number of books with similar titles uh, before the compiler's uh, time. And in our case, it's about seven centuries uh, from the second and third centuries history till the uh, compiler's time. It's about seven centuries. Uh, for example, the entry that simply states the title Kitab al uh without giving the author's name, uh, may refer to uh, Ibn al Athir's book, Al Lubab fi Tahdib al Ansab. Or five or six uh, other, uh, uh, other titles Herschler mentioned in the book. Or some other examples like the highly generic title, Tahrij al Hafil. Both of these two words are very generic. Tahrij uh, al Hafil, referring to, as Herschler mentioned, to uh, Al Hafil Abdul Ghani al Magdisi, the scholar of the 12th century. Or incomplete uh, titles such as Zawaj uh, Abil Asr ibn Rabi'ah. Uh, to whom? Uh, without mentioning Min Zainab bint Rasul, to Zainab the Prophet's daughter. By the other hand, it's common in our heritage to uh, name a book by several titles, and even every volume of a book by a title. Uh, we see it in the uh, contemporary great book Tabaqat of a Sheikh al Tahrani that every uh, volume of it uh, has its specific title. And we see different citations, even by contemporary, uh, contemporary researchers, uh, to this book. And it was more common in the uh, medieval centuries. You see the book Manaqib al Shafi'i uh, that the compiler named him himself in a part, in another part of the Fahrist, Ad Durrun Nafis fi Manaqib Muhammad ibn Idris. These are the, note, the, the points that Herschler mentioned and notices to them. So, totally, we need a great knowledge of Islamic heritage to. Um, uh, to understand which books are exactly cited and to know the exact books and authors. And as Hitchler mentioned, access to the actual manuscript is in some cases this, the only chance to sort out who is who. Let's read some parts of the book and see the ambiguity in some phrases. Majmu'un fihi juz'un min hadith ibn ma'roof wa hikayatu ibn mujahid wa thani min fawaid ibn bil hadid wa qasidatun lil silafi wa sa'atu rahmatillah ibn asatiq wa nafyu tashbih lah wa kitabu al yaqeen ibn abid dunya wa juz'un min fawaid ibn mudaffar وجزء من حديث أبي موسى المديني وجزء من حديث ابن السمنقندي وكتاب أدب الفقير وفوائد ابن المجزبان ومن أدركه الخلال من أصحاب ابن منده ومسند عابس الغفاري وكتاب الجمعة للمروزي uh, uh, And I think this entry is better than the rest of the book. Kitab in another entry, Kitab al Irshad fil Fiqh, without mentioning the author. When Nuskhatu Aleha Khattu Sheikh Abdul Qadir, these are some rare inf more information about, more information about uh, the manuscript. Tuqubimat Aleya Bihamis Mi'ah li Khattu Sheikh Abdul Qadir. We can see here the pricing of the manuscript. Majmu'un. في شرح النخبة والاغتباط 
والأجوبة المصرية والطرابلسية وفوائد وأشياء بخط أخي ووالدي Some information about his brother and uh, father that were scribes. In the end, it's very important to notice to the selections in composite manuscripts to understand what the collectors were thinking in that society and uh, the circle of humble scholars in Damascus and what their views were on the on different issues. Uh, like this catalog is important because it clearly shows us the collections in, in a lot of uh, composite manuscripts in just one library. And exactly a library that belongs to a, to a, a, a famous Hanbali scholar. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And many thanks Sid, for your insightful uh, lecture and talk. Um, and well, now, Konrad, uh, if you have any further reflections about uh, Sayed's or Sarah's uh, questions and, uh, and, and talk, uh, we are at the service now. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm obviously very grateful to both of you um, that you've taken the trouble to read this book. Um, and um, have taken your time to um, respond to it, um, both Sarah and then Sayed Ali Tabatawa Yazid um, Yazdi um, for that um, contribution. And obviously, it's very interesting for me to, to to get the feedback of colleagues how they what how they engage with the book, what, what they think is, um, is 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 interesting in the book, and what I guess what what is for me important at that. that Point and perhaps sums up why I work the way I work is I mean history is about many things so there are many reasons why people do history um, but one of the reasons or one of the drivers of why I'm interested in history or the way of how I interact with history is obviously respect you know the respect for the past and the respect for past people and how they made their life and that's very much why and I'm delighted that and if Abdul Hadi came out for you as a good person, Sarah, I mean, that's, you know, that's why I was interested in him, because it's, it's out of respect that I wanted to bring him to life and to show his personality and his, his, his agency in doing that. But it's also the reason why um, I am so interested in reading these book lists, you know, and, and, and understanding the logic of these very condensed titles, as you mentioned, um, Sayyid Ali, um, of these very brief, um, Things because they they were very meaningful at that time, and as you said, in the 15th century or 9th century history, the people they lived through these factories, they knew what was going on. They that was their home, that was their their scholarly world. That was easy for them. Um, but for us today, it's 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 difficult, and that's why sometimes these lists tend to be marginalized in scholarship because they are yeah don't seem too attractive in the beginning. But I guess once you <laughs> start to work on them and you see the beauty of them um it becomes highly addictive um i have to say and <laughs> to try to get my head around it and the, the sarah what, what would you ask with regard to what i would advise students who would be interested in that i think it's difficult to to sum that up, or probably would need more time, but <laughs> I mean, it sounds slightly hackneyed and, and, and um, yeah. Um, but, but I think in the end, it's love of books. You know, I mean, you really have to have a high love of books in order to undertake this work, to be fascinated by books and to be willing to um, track them down and um, to find these two words in a figures and then to um, see where they ended up in what library um, today. Um, in technical skills, um, I think for many people who are in the beginning of the career of their studies, um, it's quite intimidating to see the handwriting um, on these manuscripts. It's nothing I was trained in. Um, it's just something I picked up along the way later on. And I think that's how many people of us came into that. It's rare that we get formal training in reading handwriting. Um, it's something which we develop over course. And um, the the let's say the feasibility of the project was obviously supported by the fact 
but there were a lot of supportive manuscripts coming in, supportive corpora, without which it would have been impossible. For example, we have the autobiography of Ibn Abdul Hadi. When he sat down and wrote a list of all his titles, which is in print, um, it doesn't exist anywhere else, it's not known yet. We will we translate the book in the moment into Arabic, and we will publish it in Arabic. And the Arabic will also have the autobiography in it from Princeton, because it's not known in the Arab world. So this helped me a lot in reading this Fikris, because then at least I had two way times the same title in Abdul Hadi's not very legible handwriting. Um, and I think more importantly, what, what I really um, um, want to address is your question is, the more security of I focus on that challenge, <laughs> there's ridiculously a lot of material out there um, in terms of book lists, catalog, dafters, um, work documents which have just not been looked at. Um, I mean, my project um, translating the Ibn Abdul Hadi book into Arabic um, and editing the Princeton list is done together with my colleague Said Al Jumani from Berlin. Um, and he just called me today, and um, he had seen in um, Paris Library a very important book list from Ottoman Damascus, which had been wrongly classified. It's not visible. Nobody has seen it so far because the um, catalog entry is complete nonsense. And that's exactly the madrasa where Abdul Hadi endowed his books to. So <laughs> this is very <laughs> strong territory, and he just discovered it today. Um, and so. I guess if you go into these library, um, into the libraries and look at manuscripts and ask um, librarians and talk to them and look for the weird stuff, for the marginal stuff, um, there's so much out there for book culture in the 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century, which, which we haven't worked on so far. Okay, that's all from my side as a response. Once again, thank you very much for your comments. Highly appreciate it. Thank you for your response. Uh, and now, if if there is any question from the side of uh, our audience, please raise your hand, and then I will uh, enable your microphone to ask your question. Or if you want to write it down, and I will read it for you. Any questions? Could I be cheating and ask one more question? <laughs> Conrad, um, uh, I've been working on Ibn Asakir, and uh, the term Tasmiya figures very prominently in the history of Damascus. And of course, this is 300 years earlier, so I don't want to read your material backwards. Um, but I'm quite struck by his use of this term. He, he'll say, Qaratu bi khat. And then he'll name it. Then in several cases, he'll refer to something that he calls a tasmia. And it sounds to me, after reading your book and thinking more about these um, terms, and there's also other terms that come in, that collections of different things um, were being passed around. And sometimes the term tasmia is actually used to describe um, it sounds like a um, notebook that has material pertaining to particular subjects. Um, mm. They're read by Jens Scheiner in his um, work on Ibn Asakir's library as being specific titles, but I'm wondering actually if what we're talking about is something that's a little bit more a descriptive term. Mm. Um, the term occurs 1400 times, so it's, it's quite often. It's a big book. History of Damascus, you know, the biggest book in the Open ITI corpus. But still, that's a lot. Um, so I'm just, I'm just wondering how much. Maybe there's a bigger question here: is how much does the material um, that you have from, let's say, you know, 15th century, um, is it relevant to understanding what we might no longer be able to access or see from practices of people centuries earlier? Mm. I mean, the, the connection between Ibn Abdul Hadi and Ibn Asakir is very close. I mean, Ibn Abdul Hadi was a great fan of the Hadith, or of the Muhaddith Ibn Asakir, not of the Shafi'i, obviously. I mean, he had 
<laughs> strong reservations about Ibn Masaka's view in many ways, but as in Ibn um, Masaka was one of the one of the few non-Hanbalis whom he highly respected. Mm. And all the Buldaniyad, which he authors, Ibn Abdul Hadi, is the first series of the Messine Buldaniyad after Ibn Masaka. Mm. And it's clear that for Ibn Hadi, this is a reference to Ibn Masaka and it's a revival of the great period, which he sees residing in the personality of Ibn Masaka. So, I mean, I, to be honest, I haven't really thought, of, is my voice, I, I have a live slight feedback here. Is it okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, um, I haven't really thought about the term Tasmi. I mean, it was, it struck me because there's no other book in his book list, which is called Tasmi out of 3000 book titles. It's not a term which I've seen very often um, in the manuscripts. And it would be quite interesting to see where this is used in it, Masaka, but I would definitely see it as a generic term. So that's something like what we would could today call the Qaim, you know, a list. Um, so I think Tasmir um, was basically a term for a list, Kutubi. So that's why he has to add Tasmir Kutubi, um, so the list of my names. And it's alphabetically organized. So it would be interesting to see in other Tasmir whether we see also a tendency towards alphabetical organization. You know, because in Fikris is not alphabetically organized. There's no need to organize it in alphabet. It can be, but it's not necessary. Whereas with the Tasmir, it seems for Ibn Abdul Hadi, it had to be um, alphabetically. Mm. And the, the other point, I, I guess, I mean, the, if, the fikhris of Ibn Abdul Hadi gives us a wonderful insight of how people, of how individual engaged with books which are often lost, but also with books which are not lost. But in either case, it's highly fascinating to see, for example, how he changes titles. You know, so we have a title on the manuscript, and it's only via complicated ways that I was able to connect the entry in the fikhris with the actual manuscript. And we see that for him, there was no problem at all in constantly changing um, the titles. So when reading about titles and other works, I think it might be quite helpful to see the practice of Ibn Abdul Hadi, who had a very high degree of flexibility when it came to titles. Very high. I mean, the, you would never guess there's a link between the two titles. I think that's, um, yeah. Okay, thanks. And I have a question. Um, in the beginning, you uh, said that we don't have uh, the text of the endowment uh, and we just have the list of the books. But we see at the, at the, at the beginning of the, of the uh, catalog that it's exactly the endowment text. Mm, okay. Yeah, I mean, my reason why I did not identify it as a um, endowment document. Would be that we don't have signatures um, of the muwakayin um, or um, of the kutabs of the shuhud um, of the notary witnesses. So normally, I would expect a qadi to be involved somewhere in the document and endorsing it, um, or at least to have two shahid to endorse it, to witness, to witness it. No, no, no. I think it's it's very common in in the manuscript. We see that uh, uh, they just uh, say, look at here. وقف كاتبه على نفسه ثم على أولاده ثم أولادهم ثم على أنساله وأعقابه ثم من بعدهم على من ينتفع به من من الحنابلة. Uh, it's exactly this. This catalog is exactly an endowment document, not anything mm -hmm. else. But would, I mean, would it have legal validity? Let's say if there's a conflict um, twenty years later, and you would take that document and go to the Qadi um, and say, "See, my father endowed these books for our benefit," and there would be another scholar who says, "No, no, no, no. Um, actually, um, he just 
wrote it, but he never executed this um, Waqf. Um, so these books don't belong to the Waqf. I can possess them. I, I, I don't know, really. I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's an honest question of, <laughs> of knowledge, um, whether that would work in a Qadi court, where, whether he would be convinced by the fifth list. To, Thank you. Uh, uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any, any further question? I I just have a question, a quick quick inquiry. I I am wondering if if you have addressed whether Ibn Abd al Hadi has collected the book totally via uh, Sama or if there is if there is mostly via Ejaza or something in, in the middle, and how uh, this might have impact on the way we understand the Fahrist. Mm. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's absolutely essential because normally in Damascus you have the transmission of Ijaza mostly by these Sama'at reading sessions in the field of Hadith. In Fik, there were different ways, but in Hadith it was virtually um, these reading groups, communities, which assembled, the text was read out, everybody who attended got an Ijaza for the further transmission of that text. But we see that in the um, century before Ibn Abdul Hadi, these Sam'a Ijazat fell out of use. And what you rather had were rather general Ijazat, where a sheikh gives a, a student the permission to teach a specific text or a corpus of texts or all the texts which he has an Ijazat for, depending um, on the degree of the ijaza, but you don't have the actual Sama'a note anymore, where they say, we sat down on that day um, in that mosque and present where A, B, C, D, E. So when Ibn Abdul Hadi bought all these small booklets, he wasn't really able to connect to them in the way his Hanbali predecessors in the 6th, 7th, 8th century history had done via Sama'at session, because these Sama'at sessions were not recorded anymore. I don't want to say they were not held anymore, but at least they were not recorded anymore in the same way. So what he did is that he requested Ijazat from the Chiyuch of Damascus and Sheikhat um, of Damascus, and he recorded them on his manuscripts, but he often recorded them in a form which revived the old Sam'a Ijazat. You know, you could have just written, I received an ijaza from Sheikh X. Point. It would have been enough. Um, but he often tries to frame it, in, and that what his contemporaries did, because that was sufficient. But now he often tries to reframe it in the old style, um, to have kind of proto somehow on his manuscripts. So in terms of scholarly practices, he was entirely in, the, in his world. He did what? everybody did in order to receive Ijazat um, in his period, but just the way of how he recorded his Ijazat, there we see kind of a nostalgic um, element where, where he tries to revive a period which had clearly ended in the transmission. And after Ibn Abdul Hadi, we don't see anybody recording any Ijazat or Sama on any of the Hadith manuscripts. It's amazing. I mean, we are talking about in his corpus, if you take all his manuscripts, we have a five-digit number of Sama'at. I mean, it's over 10,000 Sama'at, not by him, obviously, over all the centuries. So it's a very vivid manuscript tradition. Ibn Abdul Hadi buys them, he puts his ijaza on, and then until today, for the next 500 years, nobody recorded a single ijaza Sama'at on them. Um, yeah. Okay, hey, thanks. Uh, we have a question. Uh, a question perhaps from all the speakers. Uh, I, I read it, or maybe Mahdia, I, I enable your microphone. If, if you want to be, if you want your microphone to be enabled, let me know by raising your hand. But, but I'm reading now the question uh, Has there been a difference between the Shi'i and Sunni Waqf systems? Has there been similar Waqf practices like the way or endowment practices? like the way they documented uh, Waqf deed in the Sunni and Shia tradition historically? I, I, I wonder who want to answer the question. I mean, out, of, out of Shia ignorance, I would be deeply delighted if Sayyid Ali would 
perhaps. Yeah. Maybe you said if you want to. Uh, no, no, I have no idea. idea. <laughs> okay, no, no. Um, no. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to answer that in any way, in an informed manner, on the norms of Sunni and Shi'i work practices. The only insight I have is on practices. And I'm not an expert on Iran or on um, Shiite Islam, but I mean, I've done some readings on book endowments, not very surprisingly, so um, in the Shiite um, context and how that was done at the shrines, um, for example. Um, and the impression, and that's really all I can say so far, and I would be delighted if anybody would like to add to that, but my impression is that there is not a substantial difference in the way of how book endowments were executed and how later generations dealt with them. Um, and with later generations dealing with them, I mean, that's perhaps a slightly sensitive topic, but that we see that many books leave wakfs after two, three, four, five generations and start to circulate on the market again. And then often they are re-endowed to the same institution or to another institution. So we often see a change between wakf and private ownership. And that's very vivid in the Damascus case, which I have, although normatively, obviously, it's not possible um, to a large extent. It's, you can't take the books out of the wakf, but it's done in Damascus um, constantly. And from the few insights which I have on um, Iranian libraries, I have the impression that this is not entirely different, that it also might happen. Well, uh, well, thank you. Uh, any, any further questions? Or any I, have, further questions? Uh, I have a short question, please. Okay. okay. Uh, there is a Dwayman narrated in the in the beginning of the book is that i have not uh, seen the manuscript is that uh, with the same handwriting uh, with the rest of the book and do you think it's a part of the book or it's added mm. but um it's highly likely ibn abdul hadi's handwriting um he has this very specific very clear, not very clear, very characteristic handwriting. Um, so it's, I'm 100% sure in his case, it's his handwriting. But obviously, we do not know at what point it was added. Um, was it when the Fichrist was written? Was it added three years later, 10 years later? And there's no way of putting a date um, to that dream. I think um, it is very important for the Fichrist. I think it's part of the Fichrist as it is kind of yeah, the entrance portal where the reader of the Fichris, so to say, is given an image of the Werkif, of the one who endows. And Ibn Abdul Hadi presents himself in the stream as obviously an outstanding person of outstanding piety, um, who is rightly guided, who resists temptation. So very much a framing of his own personality, which I think was very important for him on this Fichris. And maybe uh, the endowment is because of the dreaming. Do you think so? Sorry, sorry again. I mean, uh, maybe the endowment itself is because of the dreaming. Ah. So, well, to be honest, it had no cure to me. Um, might be. Might it be. Does any relations, any relationship between the, this dreaming and the endowment? No, no. So, so the, the, the dream is general, one might say. You know, I'm pious, um, I'm not a sinner, and I move away from the wrongly guided Imam. There's Imam who prays in the wrong way, so Ibn Abdul Hadi turns away. Um, but there's no, I think there's. So it's a separated part and can't be a part of the book. Mm. I mean, I, mean I, I saw it as part of the Fichris in very general terms. I didn't really see an immediate link between the two, but perhaps I should rethink it. Um, I, I, I immediately assumed it's this general 
you know, I'm endowing, it's a very important part of my biography, it's part of how I want to project myself, thus I also put this ream on there, which is basically repeating very much the same characteristics which I want to express via this book collection. But perhaps there's a more immediate um, connection between dream and, and endowment. Thank you. And perhaps if, if I may, Moxen, I think uh, something which, which I have only addressed in part in this book, but which is very much at my at my at the heart of my interest in future, um, is um, you know the movement of manuscripts between the uh, Middle East uh, with Arabic speaking lands and Persian speaking lands and Europe. You know, so this massive translocation of books which we have in the 19th, early 20th century, which I feel is kind of a topic nobody wants to speak about in Europe, really, um, because nobody wants to open up this very problematic topic, um, but which I think is something which we urgently need to address um, as scholars who are working on manuscripts. And obviously, they are the first attempts to do so. Um, and I don't think that one can just put also the movement of Ibn Abdul Hadi move uh, manuscripts to Europe um, under the heading of colonialism, plunder, and um, um, thieves. Um, but obviously, this is also a part of, of manuscript um, movements. And what we urgently need is really scholarship to understand the processes which allowed this massive movements. And this is a project which I hope um, colleagues based in Europe and the Middle East um, are able to to, um, to, 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 do, to do to to do together at some point. So that's just, I mean, it's not direct, I mean, it's slightly into it, Martin Hardy, because I only have this one paragraph in it, but I think it's typically that I only have one paragraph because we are always kind of worried if we start to speak about these topics. Okay. Maybe some scholars and students from Iran uh, take these projects. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we have a question in Arabic. I, I try to read it. Uh, since, since you know Arabic, I, I just read it in Arabic, and so you, uh, every one of you, answer in Persian, in uh, English. كيف يمكن توظيف القوائم البيبليوغرافية الشخصية في تاريخ المكتبات الإسلامية؟ أرجو الإضاءة على هذا المصدر خاصة أنه أنه لم يذكر في المنهج في المنهج الوثائقي. Mm. Uh, yeah. um, I think it. I mean, it is an absolutely. So, so the the question is, um, how is it um, possible to use um, biographical personal lists um, to write the history of Islamic libraries? Um, that's basically the question, and um, I think the the absence of direct library documents is a major problem. So we don't have too many documents, at least as far as I know, which are really on madrasa libraries, for example, in Bilad Sham um, in the pre-Ottoman period, or um, Misr, um, and I guess the same is true for the Persianate world, Iran. Um, so the personal book lists um, are absolutely essential for us to track down the movement of manuscripts and to understand ideas about book collections. And more importantly, for example, Ibn Abdul Hadi wrote this bibliography, autobiography of his own works. And we can assume that all these works were in his own library. Um, so that's quite a nice starting point um, to think about the collection of a library which he had and which later on moved to a madrasa. So if we want to write to write the history of Islamic libraries, it's clear that we have to move beyond, let's say, the, the easy material, the obvious material, um, and that we have to use these personal libraries. And the last document I showed on this scholar from Jerusalem, um, that's absolutely fascinating in order to get an insight into the book culture, culture of Jerusalem on which we don't have a single document in the pre-Ottoman period. We don't know anything about Jerusalem in the pre-Ottoman period. And that's the only um, document which we have. And so that's absolutely essential to, to get our head around that. Thanks. Okay. Uh, if there is any further questions, I think 
Well, I think there's no other questions. Uh, or um, well, well, I think we can uh, end the conversation. And I'll uh, yeah, this is just uh, thank you, thank you. So much. It was very interesting. Uh, well, uh, m many thanks, many thanks, uh, Konrad, Sayed, and Sarah for for joining here. It was a very interesting conversation, and I really enjoyed it. And many thanks all for uh, participating here. I hope uh, you had uh, you have good times, uh, dependent on where you are. Good day, good evening, good morning, uh, and uh, and hope uh, you're doing well. Uh, next week we'll talk about Abdullah Galadari's uh, uh, Quranic hermeneutics between science, uh, between science, bi between Bible science and and hadith of, uh, and tradition. I think <laughs> I, I forgot the, the title. With with uh, Kurt Richardson as discussant. Hope to see you next week, and uh, we can end the conversation now. Th thank you, thank you everyone for joining, and bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. much. Thank you I so really much. enjoyed. Thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed your discussion. Thank you. Uh, if you have any final reflections or words, uh, uh, we, we are at your service. Sorry, if you have. If you have any uh, final reflections or final words, I'm, I'm at your service. No, it, it, I mean it, it's only. I mean, thank you very, very much for this initiative, and I think it's really terrific yes. that we use that we use this technology. Um, which we now have um, the online technology to engage more closely within our different scholarly traditions. And it's mm -hmm. one of the rather problematic aspects of us being situated in Europe doing Islamic studies that we have not always been the most active and successful in engaging with our colleagues in the Middle East. So if there's any chance to do so in future, I think um, that would be great. And thank you very much for the initiative. Really Thank important. you. This is exactly the, the aim and the goal of this initiative to, to engage more scholars around the world and to, in a sense, globalize the science studies. And I hope, and hope to uh, contribute to this aim. And, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Masa. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed your uh, discussion and I'm waiting for your next researcher. <laughs> Well, I, I, hope, I hope we'll be in touch between in some way or the other. Um, so if there's any way to connect, I would be most delighted. I'm really Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you Goodbye. Goodbye, Sarah. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.